Hi, I'm Hamish Black and this is Writing on Games. Well, it's about that time of year where people indulge their obsessions with organising stuff into lists and unleash their inner buzzfeed. I figured that now I've been approached about press copies of games that I am now a bona fide games journalist, so why should I be any different? What better way to pad out an episode than by copying a format done to death by every other outlet? Obviously I'm being sarcastic, I do actually enjoy end of year lists. They're a good way to wind down and gather our thoughts or celebrate the new memories that have been created over this year. And what a year it's been. After 2014 could be defined by the industry fumbling their way into the next generation with either completely broken games or delayed release dates, 2015 could be characterised as a year that really began to deliver on some, read some, of the promise that 2014 showed but couldn't live up to. Even though the spectre of 2014 can still be found haunting us in some ways, I'm looking at you Arkham Knight, I can genuinely say that this year has spawned some of the most interesting and compelling experiences I've ever played. I should say that before I begin with this list, I don't currently own a next-gen console, nor do I feel any particular need to at this stage, and there have been many critically acclaimed games released this year that I never got a chance to play, so sorry Bloodborne, Soma, Undertale, etc. I'm sure you're all great, Bloodborne especially, but I'm afraid you won't make this particular list. So without further ado, let's begin my top 5 games that I've played, obviously, of 2015. At number 5 we have Fallout 4. Now, if you watched my previous video, you'll know that I'm very critical of Fallout 4. Technically it's a mess, but aside from that it's just not as effective as a game, nor is it as masterful an example of aesthetic design as Fallout New Vegas was in particular. That said, I can't help but feel that despite the fact that it could and probably should have been so much more than it is, the core of Fallout remains as engaging as ever. Exploring the waste land entirely unburdened by the need to follow any particular quest line with any deal of urgency, listening to the wonderfully atmospheric soundtrack that has become a staple of any Fallout game, it all still provides an experience that is distinctly Fallout. The writing, largely hampered by the wildly pared down dialogue system, was borderline laughable at times, and the main story bungled some interesting narrative beats that could have potentially elevated the game's story above those of 3 or New Vegas, but the stories that you, the player, were allowed to create on your own still remained informed by the world in which they were set, the world that Bethesda still put a great deal of effort into realising. The next iteration in the franchise desperately needs to branch out from this ageing formula, but for now the core exploratory experience remains wildly compelling. At number 4 we have Her Story, the very first video on my channel centred on this game in particular, and I'm still proud of my analysis of that title. Although I can't deny that the reason my analysis could go so in depth was because Sam Barlow's vision of a game which experimented with the very concept of what a game is allowed for that level of depth. Her Story is a game that is as deep as you, the player, want it to be. The game can be over in 2 hours, it can be over in 5 minutes, or it can simply be viewed as unbeatable. The latter certainly applies to me. This game still gets me thinking about its implications to this day, almost 6 months after playing it. It's a game that thrives on perplexing the player at every turn, but thanks to its frankly ingenious approach to fractured narrative, which you can hear more about if you watch my video on the game, democratises the process of figuring out what is going on in an ontological sense, to the point where every player's conclusion is as true as they believe it is. It achieves this through what at first seems like simply a compelling detective story, but it backs this up with an almost Brechtian level of player alienation. The game consistently shows its mechanics to the player, at once immersing the player in the experience of finding out who the woman is, or women are for that matter, but also jolting them into considering the larger picture of who they might be playing as, and why they are almost voyeuristically obsessing over the details of this case. This is the game that convinced me that 2015 was going to be a landmark year for gaming in general, but it especially indicated to me that indie games were beginning to move out of the common trappings of either focusing too much on experimental gameplay, sacrificing a well told story, or vice versa, falling into the trap of forcing the player along a heavily scripted path in order to tell the story it believed the player must experience. Her story rejects both of these scenarios, and as such has become the most engaging narrative driven indie title I have ever played. And at number 3 we have Life is Strange. I feel like episodic gaming as a whole will come under some amount of scrutiny in the coming year or so, with Telltale releasing more games than is probably beneficial to their longevity as a company in the eyes of the gaming community, I feel like they have perhaps poisoned the well of a potentially interesting concept. My advice with episodic games these days is to always wait until they are released in full. With that in mind, never has this advice panned out in my favour more than it did with Square Enix's title Life is Strange. 
The idea of waiting however long between episodes of this utterly gripping adventure game fills me with absolute dread, because it absolutely masters the art of the cliffhanger. The reason I mentioned the whole thing about Telltale at the start is because it was that scenario that made me wait out on Life is Strange, dismissing it as another pseudo-adventure game driven by a narrative that would probably be as ham-handed as The Walking Dead Season 1 was, looking back on it. I still love that game and love what it did to me at the time, but a lot has changed in games since its release way back when. Taken on its own merits though, Life is Strange tells an unbelievable story that if you were at all apprehensive about playing this game in the same way that I was, I urge you to play it regardless. I'm a real sucker for art that mixes the mundanity of everyday life with the supernatural, and Life is Strange certainly does that. Not only does it nail the drama and angst of teenage life and the drudgery of getting through it all, it gamifies the intricacies of navigating these kind of life decisions that make living the life of Max arguably more compelling than the larger apocalyptic cataclysm that threatens the town you are a part of. The writing initially seems stilted and perhaps leans into the awkward, quirky hipster teen tropes more often than I'd like but ultimately it tells a truly relatable story of the hardships of teenage life, the pain of loss and the often futile nature of choice that is hard not to become totally enraptured with. Throw in one of the most gut-wrenching twists I have ever experienced in a game and it easily secures its place in this top 5. And at number 2 we have Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Pain. This game has left me so conflicted. I even debated putting it in this list at all. Want to know why? It's not because of the story, which whilst it had numerous problems in terms of structure and padding, I felt ultimately represented a step forward in Hideo Kojima's narrative delivery, nor was it the gameplay, which I think everyone can agree is the best a Metal Gear game has ever played. No, it was nothing to do with any of that. It came down purely to the way in which Konami has treated this game post-release. This may seem petty, but the sheer nakedness of the business-like nature with which Konami has tweaked and meddled with the fundamental gameplay elements has not only cheapened the game in the way that a free-to-play mobile game kind of feels inherently cheap and nasty, it has highlighted the gears turning within the game in a way that almost completely wipes out any inclination that this game is as organic as it initially seems. This game was originally a shoe in for my game of the year, but elements such as the blatantly exploitative nature of the FOB system and the constant bombardment of daily bonus rewards, pointless MMO-like events and the mafia-like implementation of things like the insurance system, which was implemented long after the point where anyone placed any real value on resources anyway, making it as pointless as it is exploitative, only serves to highlight the fact that whilst the long lamented cut content wasn't necessarily the most crucial thing ever that many players seem to think it is, the game clearly wasn't finished and Konami had other things in mind aside from providing players with a pleasing experience. It's to the game's credit though that despite the fervour with which Konami seemed to want to cheapen the experience, the game remains an utterly incredible achievement on the part of Hideo Kojima. The decision to make the game more open as opposed to aggressive focusing on telling a linear story has been absolutely derided by many fans of the series, but for me helped to create some of the most compelling emergent gameplay moments that a game has ever provided me with. Never has a Metal Gear game made the vast array of options more fun or vital to the experience as The Phantom Pain has. The open world design confidently illustrates that restraint in terms of what is placed on the map can make the world feel more vast than any Ubisoft side quest fest where meaningless objectives are the order of the day. The side ops in Metal Gear Solid 5 became largely obsolete fairly quickly, but the fact that many of them contribute to how you operate within the open world make it feel like you are truly making an impact on it, even if, upon closer inspection, some of those mechanics are perhaps not as organic as they might initially seem. I will agree that various elements of the story could have been handled far better, but I stand by my assertion that people holding up the older games as examples of good storytelling in games is kind of ludicrous, as much as I adore how dumb those older stories get. As I said in my review, in many ways The Phantom Pain is not a Metal Gear Solid game as we know it, but in embracing this potentially alienating implementation of mechanics and story, Hideo Kojima has perhaps created the quintessential Metal Gear Solid game. I'd expect nothing less of Kojima, and despite the game's many potential disappointments, it's impossible for me to say that the game is anything other than an overwhelming success, no matter how much Konami seems to want to drive it into the fucking ground. So, before I get onto my top game of 2015, I feel like I should make some honourable mentions, because there were a lot. 
I just finished playing Just Cause 3, and whilst that game seems hell-bent on missing the point of what makes it so enjoyable through an utter waste of a story and truly uninspired main and side missions, the sheer joy of gliding through the beautiful world, destroying everything in sight, simply cannot be denied. Project Cars got me interested in racing sims again, with an almost intimidating level of tweaking available to the player, and the ability to play with any kind of car class or model you felt like on any track from the get-go appealed to me on a weirdly masochistic level. It almost feels brutalist in its design, purely designed for mechanical function over any kind of inflated narrative or story. City Skylines almost effortlessly exemplified the case against social game worlds after the disastrous Sim City, which launched a couple of years before. And although it has been in early access for years, Kerbal Space Program finally saw official release in 2015 and still plays as if the developer's joy for space exploration was the sole influence over the whole process. It still remains one of the most intimidating games created in recent years despite its outwardly friendly, cartoonish aesthetic. For for example, people have asked me if I'd recommend that game for kids, and I am almost instantaneous in turning them away from it, as I feel that without proper guidance, kids would only find frustration here, but the potential for this game to become a truly useful educational tool, while still retaining the feel of an entertaining gameplay experience, is palpable, and I wish them all the best going forward. Grim Fandango Remastered truly exemplified the archaic nature of 90s adventure game design, with some of the logic seeming absolutely incomprehensible, even after stumbling into the solution, but despite the lacklustre gameplay, the script alone makes this game worth experiencing, with some of the most atmospheric writing I've ever come across. Grand Theft Auto V for the PC took an already stunning game and made it even more vital, with features that initially seem unnecessary, but ultimately make playing previous gen versions of the game a real slog, which is a huge plus given how fully realised those versions of the game initially seemed. With all these new releases kind of getting the spotlight, however, I feel like I should say that I finally completed Persona 4 by means of PS2 emulation on my PC. And I can't possibly express in words how much I adore that fucking game. The weird thing is, I still find turn-based RPG combat and level grinding as tedious and egregious as I always have done, but the sheer scale of the game, the way it tells its story, its utterly flawless style, and the fantastical world it creates out of something as simple as kids in a high school make it an utterly vital experience, even if you have problems with the more generic trappings of JRPGs. This is a game that I will absolutely be returning to in the new year, and I can't wait for it. And so, with all of that said, I'm happy to reveal that my top game of 2015 goes to The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. No game in recent years has matched the scale of The Witcher 3. No game has made the side quests feel as meaningful as the already excellent main narrative found here. Through this, it is hard to think of a world more fully realised than the one found in CD Projekt Red's masterpiece. This is the game that PC releases for years to come will be held up against. Open world games of this size and scope aren't meant to be as polished as this. We expect to have to make incredible sacrifices in terms of quality of presentation with games like this. They are just too big to remain manageable on a presentational level, right? The Witcher 3 proves otherwise, with not only one of the most gorgeous games ever to be released, but an open world that actually feels lived in. It doesn't feel like you are at the centre of this universe, rather it feels like every place you visit on the map, while seeming like a new discovery to you as a player, feels unremarkable to the people inhabiting it. This feeling of the worn nature of the world is something that feels almost like Dark Souls in its level of realisation. Not only that, but the rugged nature of this world extends to the narrative and the writing of the game. So often in games, the player character is made out to be the hero of the experience, and the only one that can save the world from catastrophe. As I mentioned in my video on art and player agency, this does not necessarily make for a meaningful experience, and more often than not, the opposite is true. In this sense, The Witcher 3 excels not only do the side quests often appear out of nowhere from simply exploring the world and find their roots in doing seemingly menial tasks for fatigued citizens of the world who are tired of dealing with the war waging around them, the main quests of the game focus on you merely setting the stage for other characters, such as Ciri, to become the true agents of the game's story. Why then does this game resonate so absolutely with me? Because the way in which these quests are designed place an emphasis on subtlety. When you accept a contract to find someone's husband only to find they're now a werewolf and have killed many others, the choice becomes not only one of doing your job as a witcher or not by choosing to spare them, the relatable elements of Geralt's character actually come to light. 
as he has to weigh up the idea that he'll be killing someone's husband versus the idea that they might be too far gone to help and sparing him will result in the deaths of others. Ironically, it is in these Witcher contracts, the elements of the game that initially feel meaningless or grindy, go and kill this monster so you can get paid, hold the potential for player agency to become far higher than they ever do in the main quests. As is the case with almost everything in the game, the situations you are presented with are far more complicated both functionally and emotionally than they might originally seem. Hell, it's from one of these simple Witcher contracts that the game's first paid expansion unravels, and that expansion on its own feels like a full game in itself, both capitalising on what made the main game so great, but not being afraid to experiment with different kinds of story scenarios, and exploring elements of Geralt's character that the already expansive main game doesn't even touch upon. Ultimately I could go on about this game for hours, but know this, The Witcher 3 alone could make 2015 one of the best years in gaming for a long time by its existence alone. The fact that it is in such great company is testament to how amazing a year it has been, and I'm super excited to see where all this goes in the next year. And with that, I conclude my top 5 games of 2015 list. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed revisiting my memories of these games, some of which feel like they were released an eternity ago now. It also feels like an eternity ago that I started this channel, even though it was only 6 months ago. Since then though, even though content has been somewhat more sporadic than I originally intended, Starting this channel and documenting some of my essays and thoughts on game design and current releases has been one of the most rewarding things I've done in recent memory. It really means a lot to me that people seem to be interested in what I have to say, as for the longest time I felt like my writing ability simply wasn't good enough to put myself out there. Your support over the last 6 months has meant the absolute world to me in that regard, and even though the channel is still by any account incredibly small, I will keep putting out videos in the new year simply because it's an absolute joy when I get the time to do it. I would like the channel to grow, sure, but if it stays where it's at, the process is enjoyable in itself. That said, I'm real glad to have you all along for the ride, and I hope you'll stick with me to see where the next year takes me. With all of that said, have an excellent holiday and I'll be back in the new year. I'm Hamish Black and this has been Writing on Games. I'll see you next time.